So this summer, I got the crazy idea to do this little thing um, where I wanted to give my intern Zane and some students a chance to speak. Here's what I want to tell you. It is not easy to stand on a stage in front of 300 people and speak. It's not easy to do it. Uh, some people make it look easy. Some people don't. Uh, some people um, are just naturals. And what I wanted to do, what our team's goal was, is to give a chance for someone who we've identified as a leader, a couple of students who we know is walking with the Lord, to get a chance to share what God has put on their heart. And they've prepared a message. They've studied They've gone through all kinds of grind of working with me and talking about what it needs to look like. I think we spent four hours together this afternoon. And so when he, Khalil Borowski gets up here, I, I, I really, I'm going to probably be even more sensitive than if it's me. Because I don't care about if you're going to be disruptive when I'm up here. But when you have your peer up here talking to you, my hope is that you would lean a little more forward in your seat. Think about what he's saying. Think about the boldness it takes for a 16, 17-year-old to get up here and speak to you. And think about why God brought you here tonight and what he wants you to leave with when you take off from this place. Because it's by no coincidence that you're here, okay? Um, so tonight we're going to let Khalil come up and he's going to speak to you on something that God's laid on his heart. And I want you guys to put your hands together for my friend Khalil Borowski. Okay. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Khalil Borowski. This year I'll be a, a junior at Lee, and to be honest with you, you know, Dustin and I have been talking about me doing this for a while, and I kind of thought he was joking for the most part, but I guess I'm right here, so he wasn't, um, and like, to be honest, it really hasn't clicked in yet. I'm pretty sure, like, here in a minute, you know, I'll finally realize that I'm up here, so, but I definitely encourage you guys to take notes, because I definitely feel like this is something he wants you to carry with you, not just tonight, but you know, also after this, and uh, yeah, this is my first time, so uh, give me a, cut me a break a little bit if I freeze up. I'll do my best to, you know, avoid the note cards, but no promises. So um, let's just uh, start with this. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, again, so my name's Kloboroski. I, I got to share my testimony up here a few months back, but, you know, I've been struggling recently with just focusing on things that, that don't matter and missing missing the things that God wants to do with me because I'm focusing on petty things. And that's just what, you know, I wanted to talk about tonight, something that God has put on my heart. So this is a, just a personal testament, you know. I was, uh, said yes to Jesus. I was baptized by eighth grade, 14. It's pretty young. And it was really different because when I said yes to Jesus, there was really not too many problems. I mean, I didn't have too many problems as a 14-year-old. Life was, life was grand, but, you know, as I kind of got older, Society forced me to, you know, deal with things that I wasn't necessarily ready to deal with. And um, just had to grow up and just feeling like I was alone in my, in my walk with God and just feeling like it was just a time of solitude was definitely hard, you know. In Matthew 28, we're called to go and make disciples of everyone, but we're also called to claim ownership of our personal walks with God. And the reality for me is that the more and more I grew in my walk with God, the farther and farther I felt like I was growing apart from my friends. And just that constant feeling of isolation and loneliness was, was hard. But, you know, for me, it was a man named Derek Clark who came and spoke to me when I was in sixth grade and said that we love God because he loved us first and we live differently because he loved us first. You know, because I knew that truth, it was easier for me to, to deal with the isolation and the loneliness. But it, it was still hard, man. And I just got so so caught up with focusing on the all of the petty things, the things that didn't matter. I missed out on, you know, the important stuff, and, you know, I didn't see how God could use my time of solitude for anything good, because it was, it was terrible, I'm not going to lie, and um, I'm sure that all of us have felt like that at some point. We wanted to fit into a certain crowd so, so much that, you know, when we didn't, it kind of, you know, it hurt, and it, it sucked, but, you know, I know that everyone has been there at a point, so, you know, like I said, today we'll be talking about what it means to focus on things that actually matter and not miss the, you know, the things that God wants us to do. And so let's just uh, spend a time in prayer over again. Sorry. Uh, dear Lord, I just want to say thank you for giving me the opportunity to, to be up here. And just, uh, Lord, thank you for this, the constant growth of this ministry. You know, it's something not, that's not regular, Lord. I just pray that you, you have your way with me tonight and just speak through me and just Thank you for this wisdom that uh, you passed on to me and just allow me to share that with my peers. In your name we pray, amen. 
Okay, so uh, can you close your eyes for a minute? I want you to imagine something It's kind of hard. It's kind of weird, but if you close your eyes, I promise you it'll be easier to imagine. So just close your eyes, okay. So imagine you're in an airport. You have your ticket in your hand. You pass the security gates. You know, you start to notice that there's different type of people. There's people who are just getting off the plane. They're reaching for their cell phones. They're, they're calling whoever it is that's picking them up, letting them know that, you know, I landed safe. And I'll see you in a few minutes. There's people who drink at Starbucks, having casual conversations. There's people who are, seem to be running past you, pushing you out of the way because they think that they're late. And then there's you who just happens to be just on time. And you know, you're, you're right on time. You get to the gate. Matter of fact, right as you get to the gate, you hear over the PA, they call your boarding group. So you're ready to get on this plane. You get to the front and you know, the flight attendant asks for your ticket. You step out of line and allow the man behind you to step in front of you. And you realize in this moment that you're scared to fly. You're scared of the turbulence. And because of the turbulence, you know there's going to be ups and downs. So you're scared to fly, so you won't actually fly. Now open your eyes. And I'm just here to suggest that many of us, a lot of us, actually, in fact, treat our Christianity exactly the same. We know exactly where God wants us to be. And we know that there are people waiting there for us. But because we're so scared to fly, we're comfortable with staying as is. We're um, focused on the discomfort rather than what God wants us to do in our own lives. And so I'd like you to turn to 1 Corinthians 4. If you don't have a Bible, use your phone, whatever works. It should come up on the screen too. And just for uh, those of you who don't know, 1 Corinthians is all about Paul writing a letter to the church, letting the letting his children know, basically, Paul founded the church in Corinth, and uh, he was just writing to them the rebuke there, you know, the extravagant living, and, you know, Corinth at the time was a, uh, they were bawling, essentially, you know, they were rich, they were a port in between Italy and Spain, so, you know, they were doing pretty, pretty well off, and uh, they kind of just got carried away along the way, and so, uh, you know, Paul's writing to them, letting them know what they're doing wrong, and just trying to fix, you know, like a father trying to teach his children. So in 1 Corinthians 3 and 4, up to this point, they're, they're arguing about, you know, who they're following. There's, there's three apostles, Paul, there's Apollos, and then there's Peter. And basically little cliques are forming, and they're starting to choose who or not they're going to follow. And, you know, so let's, let's go to verse 9. Instead, I sometimes think God has put us apostles on display like prisoners of war at the end of a victor's parade, condemned to die. We have become a spectacle to the entire world, to people and angels alike. Our dedication to Christ makes us look like fools, but you claim to be so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are so powerful. You are honored, but we are ridiculed. Even now we go hungry and thirsty, and we don't have enough clothes to keep warm. We are often beaten and have no, and have no home. We work warily with our own hands to earn our living. We bless those who curse us. We are patient with those who abuse us. We appeal gently when evil things are said about us. Yet we are treated like the world's garbage, like everybody's trash, right up to the present moment. And what Paul is saying is that, you know, these Corinthians are, these, yeah, they're bawling out, essentially. And, you know, they have easy lives. And Paul and Peter and Apollos, they're struggling. You know, they're doing everything God's called them to do. And, you know, it's more of a matter of, hey, we're all humble servants. It doesn't matter who you follow. It just matters that we're all doing the right thing. You know, Paul, Apollos, and Peter all shared a dream. They were what you would call the ultimate misfit. Can we get the, the definition of a misfit on the screen? Yeah, a misfit is defined as one who's uncomfortable with his or her surroundings and is seemed to be disturbingly different than others. And Paul, Peter, and Apollos were the ultimate misfits because they, they cared about the important things, not the petty things. They were disturbed by the fact that you know, there are people around the world who didn't know who Jesus was, people that they walked past every day who didn't know who Jesus were, was. And they all shared that common dream. And when I think about, you know, them sharing that common dream, I have to think of Joseph, who is one of the, you know, the ultimate dreamers. And some of you may know the story of Joseph better than me, but I'll go ahead and uh, tell you, for those who don't, you know, Joseph was a, a 17-year-old boy, you know, not too, too much older than we were. And basically, uh, he was a tattletale. Yeah, so no one liked him. You know, he had 11 brothers. He was a shepherd, worked out in the field with them. But, you know, because he was a tattletale, his brothers didn't like him as much. And that's why he was favored amongst his father, because, you know, his father could always count on him to let him know what was going on. And uh, eventually, Joseph got to the point where 
you know, he wasn't even in the field anymore. He was chilling inside with his dad while his brothers were out there in the field shepherding. And uh, I can just imagine, you know, I have a brother, and if I was working while he was sitting down, I'd be pretty upset too. So, you know, Paul's, not Paul, sorry, Joseph's father like, favored him so much that he knit him a sweater. Um, you know, I, I think of, you know, like a Coogee sweater, you know. But uh, he knit him a, a sweater, and uh, you know, I just pictured Joseph frolicking and just showing off his sweater. And um, cr- interesting thing about Joseph was he had some, some uh, crazy dreams. And God appeared to him and, you know, shared with him this dream. And one day he decides it's a good idea to tell his, uh, his brothers what, what went on in his dreams. So imagine waking up at 3 o'clock in the morning and uh, waking everyone up in the household. Hey, guess what? I had a dream. Okay, okay, Joseph, what's, what was it about? Okay, let me go get my sweater on first. You know, it's kind of cold. And so, so sharing this dream, oh, hey, I dreamed that, uh, you know, I was sitting there with my bale of wheat, and you were sitting there in your bale of wheat, but you were bowing down to me. Yeah, that's it. And then good night. And then, you know, later wake up. Hey, I had another dream. Not only were you bowing down to me, but the sun, the moon, and the stars were bowing down to me. Oh, um, yeah, that, that's, that's cool, I guess. And yeah, but, you know, I just imagine someone telling me that and just me having a hard time believing with that. But that, him sharing his dreams with his brothers and his father just created his father. His father was upset and his brothers just were, viewed him with so much anguish. And you know, one day Joseph's sitting there and his dad tells him to go check up on the, the brothers in the field. And so Joseph goes out to the field and in the Bible it says, Genesis, uh, it says that uh, they see him from afar and they look at him with so much anguish that they plot to kill him. And um, just imagining, you know, how much would you have to hate your brother to, to plot to kill him? So story goes, they put him in a pit, which is much like a ditch. And, you know, some Egyptians come along the road. And instead of killing him, they sell him into slavery because they think that would be, uh, that'd be harder. So here Joseph is in slavery. He starts out working for an Egyptian turns out that uh, he works his way up in the Egyptian's household and soon becomes head of the household. And once he's head of the household, he gets accused of doing something he didn't do. So he's forced to go back to prison. And you know, all during out this process, Joseph is still holding on to the promise that, you know, he wants to honor God. And so while he's in prison, he gets a chance to interpret the dreams of his cellmates. So he interprets the dreams of his cellmates and then his cellmate got the chance to work for Pharaoh after he got out. And uh, one night, Pharaoh was having problems interpreting his own dreams, so he heard about Joseph and called him up. And Joseph uh, interpreted his dreams great, interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams as that there's going to be seven years of where food was plentiful, and then there were going to be seven years where food was scarce. And just uh, Joseph said that the only way he could you know, ultimately fix the problem is by preparing food before, and so storing food up. And so Pharaoh was so pleased with him that he made him ahead of it. And, you know, the story goes that, you know, when they're in the famine, Joseph's brothers appear to him, and uh, they didn't realize who he was at first, but Joseph knew who they were right off the bat. And, um, you know, Joseph knew that his brother's plans were to harm him, but he knew that God planned for his brothers to harm him in order to put him in a place of a position to, to prosper him. And just knowing that, he, um, you know, was able to forgive his brothers and just, I don't know, I'm so, uh, you know, just envious of Joseph, how easily he was able to do that. And one thing that's important for you to understand is that you are favored by your father. I can't get that off, I can't stress that enough. I know, I don't know many of your parents, I don't know your mom, I don't know your dad. Some of you may not know your dad, but that's okay because you are favored by your father. And I promise you that when you understand that, you start to act differently. There's just a little more pep in your step, uh, per se. I mean, once you understand that, you know, you're mandated by God, things are a little different, you know. You you talk with a little more authority. You walk with a little more authority. There's just a a change in that demeanor. And um, I know some of you are getting bullied, and uh, my heart breaks for you, but you need to understand that you are, you're favored by God, and you are no one's punching bag. And so my heart breaks, my heart breaks for you knowing that, you know, You go face persecution at school. But I promise you that God will see you through that. And you need not to get caught up and worried about fitting in with that crowd. Because those people are not your friends. They will be the people you lead to Jesus, but those are not your friends. 
And so just understand that your current circumstance does not dictate what he's going to do in your life. I know a lot of you may feel like, oh, God has already talked to me, but, you know, I'm not where he said I'm going to be, so what, what should I do with that? And just know that God's timing is, <laughs> it's, it's unpredictable. I mean, grace is not logical at all. So and one thing that, you know, just... I can't even fathom is how Joseph never complained. He never once complained. Even after everything he went through, he was, you know, he just held on to the promise that God was going to, you know, deliver him into where he said he was, and he just, that was that. And so also, just, Joseph never looked for people to co-sign on what God already signed off on. And I feel like a lot of times we do that with ourselves. We look for people to co-sign off on our dreams. And I promise you that God has put those dreams there for a reason. So, I mean, even if your friends don't, Oh, hey, that's impossible. That's, that's not the case at all. God planted those dreams there for a reason. And um, just, just know that, oh, man, I can't even fathom. Your, your dreams are, are God dreams. And some of you may have put your dreams up on the shelf somewhere, you know, in the recent past because you thought they were too big or they were too scary. I promise you if your dreams are not scary, then they're probably not of God. <sighs> so, uh why does this matter? I'll tell you why it matters to me. You know, as a Christian, I'm bothered by a lot of things. I'm bothered by the fact that there are places in the world with unclean drinking water. I'm bothered by the fact that there are people in my neighborhood, in, in my city, in Midland, that are homeless, who no one, are, no one is reaching out to. I'm bothered by the fact that there are false prophets who are paying money to put up billboards, and people are seeing these billboards, and because of a l- lack of a good understanding or in a healthy relationship with God, they're starting to commit suicide because people are putting up billboards and saying judgment day is near when in fact no one knows when judgment day is going to come. And just how these people, because of a misunderstanding with, of their relationship with God and who God is, you know, start to allow this to drastically affect their lives. You know, I'm bothered by the fact that I go to school with people every day who don't know God, yet I walk past them. And, you know, just a personal testament for me, I've always felt like I've been called to ministry, but it has been super easy for me to just let my fears get in the, in the way of that call, you know, in that, in that calling. And um, just like, for instance, we had a ministry class at camp, and, you know, I definitely wanted to take it, but, you know, I've, whatever fears kept me from doing it, and just, I kind of use Hebrews 12, you know, he talk, God talks about how you know, everything that happens is because it's going to endure our faith. And I feel like I use that as like, you know, a cop, like a get out of jail free card per se. So I'm not, I know that God has called me to ministry, but I haven't been actively pursuing it because I, I know that God's going to put me wherever he wants me at the end of the day. And I promise you, you can't do that. If You have to put your hand to the plow, even no matter what your gifts, no matter what gifts are given to you. A lot of people want to be, you know, athletes, lawyers, singers, you have to put in the work in. I mean, God's just not going to give you the gift. And so, um, you know, I have been at rock bottom, just like Joseph was. I've been in a time where, you know, I focused so much on my solitude and my loneliness that I couldn't focus on, you know, that call that God was giving me. I couldn't focus on ministry. And just there's been a lot of times where, you know, I just caught, get caught up feeling sorry for myself and just feeling like how I have to walk alone. It, it, it does weigh you down, and I promise you, it's, it does keep you from what God's calling you to do. And um, when you realize that, that God will see you through your story, when you realize that God will see you through, your story is not so depressing anymore. So those of you who feel like you've had a rough upbringing, a rough, uh, a rough past, you have a hard family life, I promise you that when you realize that that's all part of God's story for you, it, it's not so depressing anymore. Now, I'm not sitting up here saying that, oh, it's going to be easy because, you know, God's going to see you through it. it it's not. It's going to be hard. And, you know, I can personally attest to that, but I promise you that, I mean, it's all, it's all part of God's plan. And so when I think about, I talked about misfits, Jesus was the ultimate misfit. He was so uncomfortable with the way things were. He got up off the throne, came to the earth, lived 33 years, and, you know, died as a result of his discomfort. You know, he was crucified on a cross, a cross cross that was made of wood, a wood that was taken from a tree that God had planted for that exact same purpose. And so the question is not to be or to be not a misfit. 
we are misfit by default because we're all Christians. We should all feel like we don't belong. Does, does anyone ha- like ever see that one thing that just bothers you? And it, and it bothers you because you feel like, you know, other people aren't bothered by it. They just walk past it. Is that anyone? Okay, I'm glad there's a few. But uh, so, you know, all of us are discomforted by certain things. And that discomfort should drive us to, to change the way, you know, we, we carry ourselves. And one thing you need to understand is your discomfort and your dreams go hand in hand. You dream about the way things could be, so you're uncomfortable with the way they are presently. And so, let's say, I would be, I would find something uncomfortable, and Tay would find something else uncomfortable. And it's all because we're called to do different things. No, no one can, can rob your calling of you. No one can do whatever God has planned for you to do. And so, I would just like you to, you know, just let's take a time and just sit here for a few seconds. But what, what, are, what are the, can you put the question up? Okay, oh, my bad. It's my fault. We have a great tech team, by the way. It, it's my fault. I was kind of under pressure. Um, so what am I focusing on now that distracts me from the important things? For me, it's my, my solitude and me feeling like, oh, hey, um, I'm forced to do this alone, so I can feel sorry for myself now and worry about my call to ministry later because I'm, I'm just 16 and... At the end of the day, it doesn't matter if I, you know, acknowledge my, my call of ministry because I still have a lifetime ahead of that. And um, let's go to 1 Corinthians 20 and 21. I'd like to end on that. Okay. I didn't give you 21. That's my fault again. Um, so verse 20. Oh, where's it at? For the kingdom of God is not just a lot of talk. It is living by God's power. Which do you choose? Should I come with a rod to punish you or should I come with love and a gentle spirit? And just that for me, man, I don't know if that's not, you know, a call to to get up and do something. I don't know what it is. He says, should I come with a a rod to punish you or should I come with a love and gentle spirit? And Paul is just reminding, you know, the Corinthians that, you know, it's not about which teacher you choose to follow. We are all humble servants working for the same exact cause. And uh, just, just knowing that Paul, Apollos, Peter, Joseph all shared a common dream, and that was to, you know, share Jesus with people. And they stayed true to that dream and held on to that promise that they were one day going to honor God is just breathtaking. I mean, I can't express to you enough how much I wish that I could, I could be like Joseph because... You know, I definitely know what God's calling me to do, but, you know, it's often easy for me to, you know, to write that off and to do what I want my own thing because, you know, I'm scared. But these dudes, they never once complained about the trials they went through or, you know, when everything seemed like it was over. I mean, if I'm in prison, I'm not probably going to think I'm going to end up in a place of authority. But just knowing that they they clinged on to that, that promise that, they will one day, you know, be able to, to honor God with their story is, is amazing. And um, let's see where I want to go with this. Just know that without the lows in life, we won't learn how to appreciate the highs. And if life is all the time just, you know, if we're on highs all the time, then we get, we get high on ourselves and we don't think we need God. And the lows, you know, they're there to remind us that we are in dire need of a God. And I know it's hard to you know, kind of step back and realize that, you know, this is bigger than me. I'm, I mean, why do I have to struggle now if, you know, I'm going to be put in a place of authority later to, to share God with one another? Well, I'll tell you why. Because years from now, you know, someone's going to look back at me. Oh, hey, wasn't that that kid in seventh grade who, you know, was depressed, who was full of insecurity? And how, how, did, how did you end up here? And that's where you tell him, man, this is what God did with me. This is, this is how he changed me. This is what happened. These are steps I took. And I promise you, once that changes you, once that gets a hold of you, it will radically, radically change you. And um, let me restress the, the point that dreams and discomfort go hand in hand. 
you dream about the way things could be, so you're uncomfortable with the way they are presently. So I encourage you, you dream big dreams, man. What is that? That one dream where, you know, you woke up in the middle of the night and could not go back to sleep. You're like, God, man, if you'd use someone like me to do something like that, man, I'd be excited for that. I'd be, I'd be all for that. What, what is that one dream for you? And you know, Romans 12, it talks, that, he says that by embracing what it is that God has for you is the best thing that you can do for him. Your calling has nothing to do with you, like I said. It's, it's all part of a bigger picture. You're not part of, you know, it's just not about Kloboroski. It's about how is Kloboroski going to bring, you know, glory to God and advance his kingdom one day. And so uh, the worst thing you can do is run from, from your calling that God has, you know, given to you. And I pray that, you know, you focus on that and just, uh, you don't have to answer the question now, but what is that one thing that, that draws your focus, that makes you, that makes you miss out on the important things that God is doing in your life? And uh, I'd like to leave you with a quote. The, he's a, a theologian, you might say, uh, Dr. Seuss. Yeah. You won't lag behind because you'll have speed. You'll pass the whole gang, and you'll soon take the lead. And wherever you fly, you'll be the best of the best. And wherever you go, you'll top all the rest. I'm sorry to say so, but sadly it's true. The bang-ups and hang-ups can happen to you. Even a secular children's author knows that there's going to be ups and downs in life. But he also says that we shouldn't use uh, the fact that we're scared to take flight, we're scared of the turbulence, we're scared of the ups and downs to keep us from actually flying. And you know, God promises there will be ups and downs, but God is also only asking that we get on board. He's not asking us to pilot the plane. And I promise you that God's a good pilot and he's not going to start by crashing with you. So just, man, I can't get across how I wish that I would have, you know, when I sat there in ninth grade, felt like I didn't have any friends. I was, you know, felt so bad for myself when I knew that there's so many things I could be doing, man. I just, I just wish that I saw through all the things and just, you know, accepted the fact that I'm a misfit. I'm a misfit by default because I'm a Christian. And, you know, as Christians, we aren't supposed to feel like we fit in most of the time because, uh, you know, the world operates contrary to the way God wants it to be. So um, just a takeaway point, there's going to be ups and downs, but that doesn't mean you should take flight. Thanks for, thanks for having me.